thank you. Good morning. It's uh, so awesome being here in Turin again for, I think, the third time. Uh, I, I love this city and I love this conference, and it's awesome seeing all of you here at this hour. Um, we have a lot of content today. Myself and Christoph are going to uh, deliver two talks about TCA today, uh, so let's just get right to it. Uh, first, uh, a bit about me. I work for a company called Monday.com. Uh, I do a lot of open source work, especially in uh, Rx Swift and combined uh, reactive programming. Uh, I speak at a lot of international conferences, uh, exactly like this one, and uh, a huge fan of Hackathon and a uh, winner of some as well. Uh, also, I'm an uh, author and editor at Codeco.com. Some of you know it as uh, Ray Wenderlich. The name changed recently. Uh, I worked on uh, some of these books, all, all of these books that you see here, and some tutorials uh, on the website as well. So what am I going to teach you today? Uh, first of all, I want to kind of teach you what is the composable architecture at all, and a bit about architectures in general. I want to teach you what TCA tries and aims to solve, and some of its basic principles. And finally, we're going to spend most of this talk actually doing some live coding, so uh, fingers crossed for me. And we'll uh, finish by wrapping up uh, with some resources for you to learn once you get home. Oh, and I'll do my best to not confuse you, despite this being a relatively fast-paced talk. So I hope you're all alert and awake. So let's start with the basics, the composable architecture. What is it? So this is uh, basically a library that was developed by Brandon and Steven from uh, Point Free. Point Free is this video series about functional programming. If you don't know it, I really highly recommend checking it out. It's a library for building applications in a consistent and understandable way with composition, testing, and ergonomics in mind. And if we go back to the composable architecture, maybe let's zoom in on the word architecture here for a moment. When we talk about architecture, I like to think of it as some set of rules, techniques, processes, and patterns to develop some piece of software. And usually when you have such architecture in place, it creates a unified way to build features in a team uh, in a way that's scalable, testable, and reduces confusion. And we can't really talk about architecture without talking about state and state management. So let's kind of dive into that real quickly. Uh, when you try to define state, what is state? The state is just the total of all of the information that's required to run our app and keep track of its condition at a given moment in time. It basically means that everything that's drawn on screen, anything that your user does, that state, no matter where it's stored, it's stored somewhere, and it's all of this data that's used to drive your app. So in UI kit days, if we can call it that, uh, it's quite common for your UI state to be inconsist inconsistent with your app state. For example, you might have a UI button that's enabled, and you might have a view model that says it's disabled, because there's no real mechanism to force them to stay connected to each other. So they might be in disparity quite often. It's quite common, especially in older code bases. In SwiftUI, though, state rules everything, for better and worse. So that means, for example, with a text field, you always have to provide some binding. You have a mechanism that's built into SwiftUI that forces the data source and the UI component to be always in sync with each other. Um, so you always have this state synchronization across UI and data layer. And that's why a lot of time we see that saying that UI is always a function that receives states and draws UI on the screen. That's usually great and helpful, but it can easily get difficult when your app grows beyond its basic steps. We usually start, start out with some state, we grow into some shared state, then we get into shared mutable state, and finally we get to some shared global mutable state. And those two areas at the end are the most painful ones usually for teams. The reason it's painful is that that state is usually uncontrolled. I think all of you know the scenario where you have some state, and you have a few different consumers, or in a real-world scenarios, a few more consumers trying to change this data and read it all the time. And then your view will try to read this information, and it would have three items and can add item true. But why and how? How did we end up in this state? We have no idea, because there are so many players changing this data. So this leads to a lot of race conditions and unexpected states, but really it makes it hard to reason about our application. We don't know why and how our application ended in that specific state. So, so with TCA, the composable architecture, it tries to solve this by having what's called a single entry point system. So only one way to change state in your entire app. You wrap your state in this store, and the store also defines a set of actions. And these actions are the only way to change your state. Basically, you can send something like add item or delete item. 
and then the store, using this reducer function, which we'll talk about in a moment, defines how to actually mutate your state based on the action. So you can say add item, and that will cause the item attached to it to be appended into the items array. So here, for example, we can do add item, delete item, add item, just dispatch all of these actions into the store. And when we look at the state and we see three items and that you can add an item, we can easily trace back because we can see a list of actions that were dispatched. And as we mentioned, actions are the only way to change state. So we can easily know how did we get into this state, why did we get into this state, and how state evolved over time. And the reducer is just a simple function. It's a function that takes our current state and the new action that was just dispatched, and it says, okay, I got this add action. What do I want to do with my state now? Okay, I want to go into my state, take this item, and put it into the state. So it's a very simple function. It's really simple and easy to test relatively to other ways. Um, and it's quite nice if you come from Redux or React, you probably use this pattern as well quite a lot. Finally, the last piece of this puzzle is side effects. So when we change state synchronously, for example, just appending an item to an array, we don't have any side effects. And when we talk about side effects, we mean about some asynchronous long running piece of work, for example, a network request or some timer. For example, I might have gotten an add item uh, action and as a response to it, I want to run some network request. So this is a side effect. And because the only way to mutate our state again is an action, this side effect will actually return a new action to handle this side effect as well. This might be a bit confusing, but we see it, we'll see it a bit in code in a moment and it would make a bit more sense. Um, so focusing back on this, this time let's zoom in on composable. And let's talk about composition and modularity. So really modularity is something that a lot of teams want because it really increases velocity, it lets you work on a simple piece of your app without having to build your entire app. So in TCA, there, this is another built-in story that you can use to, to do this. Basically, you take your big app, your big state, your big reducer, your big actions, and you slice them down, you scope them down to smaller and smaller pieces that each of them are isolated. And really, each of these pieces can live in its own module. For example, I can just build the cart module and I don't have to build my app. I can just work in isolation on the cart, write tests specifically for it, and it doesn't even need to know all of these parent features. It can live in its own uh, world, which is quite nice and useful. So now to the hard part. Let's, uh, let's see this in action. Okay, so uh, we have this simple Pomodoro timer app here. Um, let's go do this, here we go. And uh, you will be able to kind of type text here and uh, play a timer and um, press one of these items. And I have a simple Pomodoro review here to, uh, to draw the UI. And as we discussed earlier, we need some reducer, state, store, all of these things to get started. So first of all, I'm gonna start with making a file for my Pomodoro view. I'm just gonna call it Pomodoro Swift. And in it, I'm gonna import composable architecture. And I'm just gonna create a struct called Pomodoro. And the only thing I would need to do here is conform to something called reducer. And this reducer needs three things. First of all, like we talked, it needs actions. So it needs a way to change the state, things that are happening inside your UI or side effects. And this is usually an enum because action is a single thing. You can't have multiple different states of the action. The second thing is a state. So a state also can be an enum or a struct. In this case, we're gonna use a struct. Uh, for the state. And the last thing we need is a reduce function. And I'm gonna return none here and we'll explain it in a moment. So these are the only thing you need to define a feature, a reducer basically. And this reduce function, as we mentioned, it just takes your current state, which is mutable, it's in out, and it takes the current action and it says, based on this action, how do we wanna mutate the state? Uh, there's also a nicer version of this that's relatively new, called a reducer builder, where like in a Swift UI view, we can just return a body, we can return some reducer of our Pomodoro state and our Pomodoro action, return a reduce inside. This will have a state and action, and here I'm gonna return none. So return none, what this means is there are no side effects to run. We don't have any actions as well, so we have nothing to run here, so it makes sense, but once we have some actions, we'll see how we can return useful things from this area. 
Uh, also, a shorthand syntax here, we can also just use some reducer of Pomodoro, and it will automatically infor, in, infer the, the state and the action from that. Cool, so now let's think of our domain. We have our app, let's start with this play button. Let's define a few actions to, to interact with our, with, our, uh, with our feature. So I'm gonna do a start tapped action and a stop tapped action, and I'm gonna set some state, is timer active. And I'm gonna switch over my actions. And the nice thing here is that the compiler is gonna force me to handle the current actions and any new actions I add to my reducer. For example, here, I will define that the start tap means that my state changed in a way that the timer is now active. And on the other side, it's gonna become inactive. And now it's complaining because I always need to return some side effect. I need to define what's happening after. But in this case, I don't have any side effects. I'm just returning none from both of these cases. Cool. Now let's plug it back, let's plug it into our view and see how it works. So the thing the view needs is called a store, which we discussed earlier. It kind of holds all of these pieces together. So we can just have a store, and this store is generic over the state and action. Uh, we can just do Pomodoro state and Pomodoro action. And like the previous shorthand, we can also do the shorthand here and just say we want a store of Pomodoro and it's a bit nicer. Now I'm gonna go and fix my initializers. Uh, and to initialize a store, I just need an initial state, which is Pomodoro state. Uh, Pomodoro state. And my reducer, which is, a, which is just Pomodoro. And I'm gonna copy this over to my app start point as well. Okay, and now finally, let's see how we can actually use this inside the view. So we can actually use our store inside this view because the store isn't really an observable object. So we can't be notified when the state changes. To be notified, we need to wrap it in something called a view store, which is specific to Swift UI views. It's an observable object and it automatically notifies the view when things need to be re-rendered. So to do this, we have this helper view called with view store. We pass this our big store and we say, which piece of the state will cause the view to re-render? In this case, we're gonna use the entirety of the state, but if you have a big store, you might want to make a smaller piece of state so not every ch state change causes everything to re-render. I'm gonna wrap, the, wrap my entire view with this view store. And now that I finally have access to my view store, I can use it. So in my button, I can check if my view store is timer active, I'm gonna send an action of stop. And otherwise, I'm gonna send an action of start. Okay, and I'm also gonna update this icon that if timer is active, I'm actually gonna have a stop circle fill icon and otherwise I'm gonna have a play circle fill icon. Okay, nice, let's run this and see what we have so far. So when I press the play button, it toggles to stop and then back to play like we expect. But how can we actually know what's happening here? So there's a nice operator. If we go to our app, we can tack onto this reducer something called print changes, which some of, you, some of you might know from SwiftUI itself. Now when I run it, anything I do is printed here. And you can see that some actions are start and a stop and a start with dispatch and exactly how it caused our state to change. So it makes it really easy to see exactly how everything we send to our store causes our state to evolve, which is really, really useful. Now let's move on to our text field. So for a text field, as you know, we need a binding. So a binding is really composed of two things in Swift 2.8, composed of the state itself that we read, like the string, and because there's only one way to mutate, which is actions, we need an action to change the state. So let's add both of these. I'm gonna add a timer title changed, which is our action, and we're gonna have a timer title. And back in our view, sorry, oh, sorry. It's of course uh, asking me to implement this specific action and all I have to do is grab this title and mutate my state. And I don't have any side effects here. And now back in my view where I just have a constant here, I'm gonna replace it with viewstore.binding. This is another helper that helps us take an action and state and make, make a binding out of them. So here, what's the state I want? I want the timer title. And which action do I want for the change? Timer title changed with the string. And now when I run it, 
you see that I can finally type, and everything I type is also showing here, meaning every piece of information I type is an action. So again, we can even follow to the letter being typed on our UI. So we can really see anything that the user does. We can track it and debug it, and it's, it's quite nice. Um, I'm gonna add a quick uh, computed property here called is start disabled. We're gonna return if the, time, if the timer title is empty. And back in our view, um, yeah, I'm gonna change the button opacity here. Let's find the button. Opacity view store is timer disabled to 55, otherwise one. And I'm also gonna disable the button based on is the timer disabled. Is start disabled, sorry. And for the text field, I'm also gonna disable it when the timer is running because we don't want the user to be able to type if the timer is currently running. Well, let's run this quickly and see that now our button is disabled. Once we start typing, it becomes enabled. And when we play, we can no longer tap here. So because a reducer is such a simple function, we can easily write logic that makes sense. We can easily reason about things that are happening in our system. And the nice thing about this is it's also really, really testable. We already have a tiny test suite here that's prepared. Let's write a quick test for this. I'm gonna call this test toggling timer. It's gonna be async, because the store is asynchronous, effects are asynchronous basically. And to test our store, we have a tool called a test store. It looks exactly like a regular store, but it needs uh, some state, some reducer, and that's it for now. And then I can just do await, store, and send it something, for example, my start tab. And let's, let's kind of run this and see what happens. If Xcode will allow. Again. Okay. Okay, great. So now it's failing, and it's failing because I sent an action, but I'm not asserting how my state changed. Now I can open this trailing closure, and I can say, okay, now that I sent start tapped, what do I expect to change? Okay, I expect my timer active to become true. And when I send a stopped, I expect it to become false again. And now when I run my test, it passes. So we can not just track our state, we can easily write really comprehensive tests for exactly how every action we send causes our state to evolve and change, which is really, really nice. Now let's, let's get an, an actual timer running on the screen. So going back to our Pomodoro, I'm just gonna add some state here for this. Seconds elapsed zero. And I'm already gonna plug this to the UI because we have a timer view here on top. View store, seconds elapsed. And now what do I need to actually get a timer running? Timer is something that happens over time, asynchronous, so this already kind of sounds like a side effect like we discussed earlier. So here, uh, instead of um, when, the, when it starts the timer, instead of returning none, I'm gonna return a specific side effect called a run. This is one of the built-in side effects that come with TCA, but there are plenty others. And this gives us a block to run asynchronous work. And there's this send argument which we can send new actions to. So now to run a timer, I'm gonna just add a clock here. It's gonna be a continuous clock. And I'm gonna say for await in clock timer every, uh, every one second. And then I need to do something every second to uh, progress the timer. I want to increment my seconds by one. But again, I can do this. I need an action to mutate my state. So I'm gonna add a timer ticked action here. And I'm gonna send this every second. And here I only have to handle my timer tick action, increment my seconds elapsed by one, and return a none here. Uh, and also, when the user uh, stops the timer, I'm gonna reset this back to zero. Okay, let's run this quickly. Work. 
So as you see, the timer is running, and we also see uh, that our timer ticked is being dispatched and mutating the seconds elapsed every second. And now when I press stop, whoops, something's wrong. It keeps running. Even though its timer active is false, the timer keeps running. The reason is this is an asynchronous effect. It keeps running, and we didn't define any way to cancel it. This is another thing that's nice that's built into DC TCA, which is can cancellation. So we can just tack on to our run something called a cancelable, and we can attach any ID here, uh, any hashable. I'm just going to define an, a private enum here specifically for this purpose. I'm going to call the timer cancel ID. And then I can just pass this here. And in on the stop, instead of returning none, I'm going to return a cancel effect. And it can take an ID or multiple IDs. I'm going to pass the same ID. So this means that I have a long running effect. It's, it's identified by this ID. And when you stop, it cancels that ID. So now when I run it, two, and I stop, and it flips back to zero, and it actually stops like we expect it to. So now let's, let's kind of update our existing test to take a look at how that, that works. So I'm just gonna comment out this stop so we can see how time increments. Let's run this. Okay, great, so it, it's failing expectedly because of this problem. It says that if an effect uses a clock or a scheduler, make sure that you wait enough time for it to perform the effect or use a test clock. So here again, maybe I want to advance my timer a few seconds to, to see how it evolves. But how am I going to do that? Am I going to reach into my Pomodoro reducer by hand, go to the clock, actually wait five or 10 seconds? We don't really want to do this. So again, another thing bundled into TCA, which is really nice, is its own dependency injection resolution library. So here in a reducer, instead of just using a regular clock, we can use this property wrapper called dependency and say, I want a continuous clock. This dependency is built into TCA, but you can also create your own for your own dependencies. I'm just going to say it's a clock. I don't have to define the type because it's inferred by this key path. And now, I didn't have to change any of my code. This is still a continuous clock. But now what I can do, I can open up this trailing closure, which we ignored earlier, called prepare dependencies. And this lets me change the dependencies that are injected to my test store. So I can say that instead of my real continuous clock, I will use a different clock called the test clock. And now I can actually control time. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so this means I can actually go to my test clock and say, uh, just advance yourself by, f by one second, for example, or by three seconds, whatever I want. And now when I run it, it fails, but for a different reason. It says, OK, you waited three seconds, so there were three timer tick events. You didn't tell me they're going to happen. So we, again, want to test for everything that's happening in our system. So I'm going to say, OK, after the clock is advanced by three seconds, I expect the store to receive a timer tick. And this should cause my state to be one, and then two, and then three. And finally, when I stop my timer, I expect it to drop back to zero. And now everything is running and everything passes. And now we tested actual time passing. And this could be 100 seconds. And you wouldn't actually wait 100 seconds because we are controlling this fake clock in a way that's really hard to do otherwise. Um, let's go back to our view to show a tiny cool bug here. But actually, first, I'm going to go to my app. And because I can control the state, I can do whatever I want. So instead of starting at 0, I'm going to start at almost 25 minutes. I'm going to start at 24.55. I'm going to write a goal, uh, survive this talk. And one, two, three, four, five. OK. This should have stopped at 25, right? Because the Pomodoro timer is 25 minutes. But we didn't define any logic that does this. So we kind of discovered a bug here. Let's see how we can, uh, how we can fix it. So again, this is a really easy thing to fix because we have this reducer where we can just write all of our logic in a single place. So every time our tick changed after the increment, we're just going to check if our seconds elapsed is equal to the total seconds, which is just a constant I have that's 1,500, 25 minutes. And, but what are we going to do once that arrives? We actually want to simulate what would happen if the user tapped the button. 
So instead of returning a non side effect, I can just return a send side effect, which delivers a different action. And now, when I run this, it will do one, two, three, four, five, and flip back, and you see that automatically a stop tapped was happening, and it dropped back to zero, and timer active is now false. So everything we expect to happen is actually happening, and we can see it happening live, which is really, really nice. But of course, because we are amazing developers, we're going to write a test for this as well. So I'm going to add a new test called um, test timer and naturally. I'm going to be async as well. And I'm going to copy this top portion because it's the same until the start tapped. But I'm going to start my state at, um, sorry, timer title, uh, sorry, at seconds elapsed. 1495, I also want to add a timer title here for both of my tests. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, great. And now what I expect to happen is when I move the clock five times, so I'm going to do a wait clock, advanced by, mm -mm -mm -mm. seconds five. Let's see what, we, what happens in our test when we do that. So again, it's failing because it's saying, okay, you didn't handle the timer ticks, but also you didn't handle my stop tap. So we already see that it's acting the way we expected it to, but let's just assert that it's actually happening. So like before, we're gonna assert that a timer tick happens, but now we expect to go 1496, 7, 8, 9, 500. So 7, 8, 9, 1500. And then the end, we expect to, to get a stop tapped and we expect the state to change in the same way it did here. Let's run this quickly. So again, we fixed the bug now and wrote a test to confirm that again, the timer automatically stops when we reach 25 minutes. And this is, I could actually fix this bug without ever running my app. I could just verify my logic and know that it works this way without ever running my app, which is pretty, pretty nice. Okay, so now this, the last big portion of this screen is that we want to actually add timers to our Pomodoro list here uh, once the user stops. So first of all, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna remove this default state. And uh, to save items, I need some state, of course. So let's store some timers here. And again, as we mentioned, we want to add a new item when the timer stops. So when the timer stops here, and before we reset all this information, we'll check if the state of the, if the current seconds are larger than zero. The reason is if the user does play and immediately stop, we don't want to add this to our list. And I'm gonna reach into my state and append a new timer item. It's gonna have some UUID, and the title is gonna come from what the user typed, and the seconds are gonna be from my state as well. I'm gonna put the current date on it. And in my view, instead of just having this fake list of items, we're gonna add a for each here. I'm gonna say that for each of my timers, I'm gonna add a timer list item view with a timer, and we'll take care of this action in a moment. Let's see how this looks. Okay, one, two, stop. It's added here, but we can also see in our state that it evolved Right, we see that our timers array got this new item. And even if you have a million items here, you're only gonna see the one item that was added. So again, really, really useful and uh, nice to work with. So now let's run our tests again and see what we broke with this change. So of course it's failing because it's saying, okay, there's a new item. You didn't assert for this happening on the, time, on the stop. So let's, let's try to, to fix this. And we'll say that we expect some timer item with our current UUID, and uh, we call this amazing work, and the time relapse should be three, because what, that's what we assert, and that the date should be a current date. And as you might expect, when we run this test, it will fail, it will fail consistently, and the reason is, the UUID and date are gonna be different every time we run this test, right? This is another dependency that we don't control. The system generates new UUIDs every time like the clock did before. 
So like we have a clock dependency, we actually have the same for UID and for date. But now instead of reaching out to our UID initializer, we get this UID generator, which is just a closure, we invoke it, and same for our date. And now this real code, again, it will work exactly like it did before, but now we can easily mock our state, mock our dependency, sorry, that instead of returning a real UID every time, I'm gonna create a new UID generator that's always gonna return my test UUID. And I'm gonna do the same for my date. Uh, date generator, test date. And now I know for sure that every time my test runs, it's gonna return the same UUID and the same date. And now when I run it, this is passing. And I just need to copy this same assertion down here, but with 1,500 seconds, because this is going all the way up. Uh, let's see what I miss. Just oh, I didn't, of course, take my dependencies with me. Great. OK, great. Now we actually want to do something once, uh, once our item is tapped in the list here. We'll want to present this timer sheet. The timer sheet view, just a simple, let's see if we can get a preview running for this thing. So it's just a simple model sheet that will show the title of the work, how many minutes you spent on it, and give you a way to delete this item from the list if you want to do that. Uh, this, is al this already has a store and a reducer. It's really simple. It has a single action for tap to remove, and it has only a single piece of state, which is our timer item. So this is a way to show you that this timer item view, which is a separate screen, has its own reducer and everything. We can take all of these files and put them in a separate module and work only on this timer sheet separately without the parent even knowing about it, which is really, really nice because, again, we can work in entire isolation, have a separate tests and everything, and it would just work. Um, so now we do want a way to, to communicate from the parent to the child if we want to present. So we'll go back to our Pomodoro view. And here, when it's tapped, we'll want to send some new action, which we don't have yet. We'll add it in a moment. And we'll say that the timer item was tapped, and we'll send the ID of our timer. Let's add this item now. Timer item tapped with an ID, which is our timer item ID. Nice, and let's uh, handle this action here. And here, I just want to print the, 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 the specific timer. So I can reach into my state timers and go first where the ID equals that ID. But actually, TCA ships with another built-in library that you can use separately called Identified Array. I can just flip this regular array to an identified array of timer items. And now I get a bunch of free capabilities on, item, on uh, items in an array that are all identifiable. I can just go to my array of timers and get the first one that has an ID of my ID. Let's just print this and see what we're getting. And as you see, when I tap it, it's actually printing it here. So this, this is working. We have everything hooked up. But now, as we said, the timer sheet is entirely isolated. It doesn't know about Pomodoro. So how can we glue them together? So we need a way, like we saw in the slides earlier, to take all the big state, the big actions, the big reducer, and scope them down to this smaller domain. Um, so because the parent always knows uh, the child state and the action in order to run. So if we have Pomodoro and timer sheet, Pomodoro needs to know timer sheet, but not vice versa. And the way to make this work is we need to keep track of actions for the child. For example, timer sheet action. This would be a timer sheet action here. And we're gonna have to keep state of the timer sheet here as well. But for things that we want to present, like a modal sheet, there are a few built-in helpers that we can use here. We can wrap our action with something called a presentation action. This is gonna add another layer 
above our actions, we got dismiss action. That means that automatically when the user dismisses the screen, we're going to get another dismiss action. It's going to handle changing all of the state. And to make these two pieces talk, we, also, we can also add this presentation state property wrapper here. And now we have both of our action and our state kind of uh, kind of contained in the parent of the small feature. Cool, now we also want to update our item here. So when the user taps the item, we'll go to our state um, timer. Oh, sorry, we didn't, yeah, timer sheet. And here we need to provide a timer sheet state. So we'll need to un unwrap this, sorry, we'll need to take our timer like we did here. So you just take this timer and flat map into a timer sheet state in it. Let's see what's failing. Oh, it wants me to, again, handle all of the actions. I don't have anything to do with timer sheet action yet, so I'm just going to return none here. Okay, so far so good. Now that we have all of the state happening and we're saving the state when the user taps the item, we need to start slicing the state and reducer and everything down. So we start with the reducer. On each reducer, there is a reducer operator called a flat. And the way a flat works, it checks if the state flips from nil to non-nil, it will unwrap it and create a new smaller reducer for us to work with. So it's already taking a presentation state, which is our timer sheet, and it, a key path to a timer sheet, actually. It's like it wants something called a case path, which again is something TCA kind of invented. It's like a case path, but for enums. It pointed a specific case of an enum. So here, I would just want to have a slash action timer sheet. Notice it's a slash facing the other way. And once this happens, we want an instance of our smaller reducer timer sheet. And that's basic. oh, and here we need this dollar sign because it's a presentation action. So it goes into the property wrapper's projected value. So this is all we need to do to take the big state, the, sorry, the big reducer and cut it into a smaller reducer that fits our small features once it runs. Uh, also pretty, pretty nice. And back in our view, we need to do the same for our view. We can, at the end of our view store, whatever, wherever we want, tack on this sheet modifier, but there's a specific sheet modifier that works with stores. It will take a store and some content. So we can take our big store and say, okay, we want to scope this store to a small store. And it wants a couple of things. It wants the state. So this is again going to be our timer sheet. And it wants an action. So this is just going to be Pomodoro, action, um, timer, sheet. And once, these, uh, and once this store is scoped, we're going to get a new store. And as you can see, this store is scoped to timer sheet. So this means, again, when this state flips from nil to non-nil, we will get a new small store that we can use to drive our new view. And now all I have to do is pass it to my new view. I'm just going to wrap it in navigation view drive a new timer sheet view here and pass my small store. And now I have a way to take this big view, big reducer, big action, everything, and slice it down. And now the timer sheet only needs to know what they need to know. Uh, let's uh, run this and see what we got so far. One, two, tap, and it's presenting. Uh, so this is all we need to do, and again, this is entirely isolated, can move it to its own model, uh, work on it separately without having to run my entire app. You'll notice finally that tapping this remove button, it doesn't do anything, but we can see that the parent receives a timer sheet presented tapped remove. This is actually a really hard thing for other types of frameworks. We have parent-child communication by default. The parent of all features knows exactly what the child feature does, and this lets us do a lot of interesting things. For example, who holds our timers right now? It's the Pomodoro, it's the, it's the parent. So going to our Pomodoro, we can just add some new logic that specifically said that when the timer sheet presented tap to remove, we're going to just turn around, go to our state timers, and remove an item with the same ID. What is the ID? The ID of the currently presented timer. Uh, state. Timer, uh, sheet, yes, thank you. And now we're going to pass on the ID here, remove the ID. Okay, great. 
And we're also gonna reset this, the, the, the sheet state back to nil to notify that we don't have anything on the screen anymore. Let's run this hopefully one final time. I'm gonna have one timer, another timer. I'm gonna press this. It's gonna show the specific one when I delete it. It's gonna remove it from the screen. We can see exactly again that our first timer was not affected, but our second item was remo removed and we can easily see how our state evolved. And uh, this is it for this, uh, this section. <laughs> so, to wrap up, a few last points. Um, first of all, with TCA, we're encouraged to model and isolate our different domains of logic. So we had the timer sheet domain that we could model separately, and we had the Pomodoro uh, domain which we could model separately. And then we can easily compose them and test them in isolation in a way we see fit. So really, essentially, TCA is about providing some sort of control over your app. Either it's controlling your state and mutations, your dependencies, controlling time, and uh, side effects, and of course, controlling our tests. Uh, there's so much more to learn. There's no way I could fit more than this in 50 minutes. So please, I implore you to go to the point free materials, whether it's the video series or the repo, and learn about view states and switch stores and custom dependencies and all of the amazing things that this uh, library offers. Um, the entire project is open source, and many of the libraries we discussed today, like dependencies and clocks, identified, they're part of TCA, but they're also separate uh, dependencies. So it means that if you just want to have identified array in your app, you can use that. You don't need to take all of TCA if you're not ready to do that yet. There's a lot of really interesting tooling there uh, that's gonna make your day-to-day -day life easier. Uh, and there's also a thriving community, and the proof to that is that we have two back-to-back -to -back talks about this topic today. There's a new Slack channel, relatively new, where a lot of the community kind of hangs around, the, and Stephen and Brandon also hang around there that, to answer your questions. I uh, really invite you to join. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, if you did,